Welcome everybody to the Center for Medical Simulation weekly webinar. This is a series of connections that we've built over the last few months to keep us all talking with each other, supporting each other, dare I say, mentoring and peer mentoring each other through the COVID pandemic. And I'm uh, delighted to have this uh, opportunity designed and built by my wonderful colleague, Damien Shield, who leads our faculty development program here. And Damien actually tweets under Debrief Mentor. So I know that's something he thinks a lot about. Really delighted to have uh, Risa Lewis with us and Adara Landry. Um, Adara is a, an assistant professor at Harvard Medical School, an emergency physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and she's the assistant residency director. So she's a very busy person. But what really intrigued me after reading uh, Risa and Adara's great article was the fact that um, Adara also has a formal uh, mentoring role within Harvard Medical School. She's one of the facilitators of the Canon Society, one of the uh, student societies that help students stay connected at, at Harvard Medical School. So within that, she has to formally mentor 40 or 50 people a year. So I think that's a really heavy lift. Risa Lewis is a doctor and a professor of emergency medicine and a professor of radiology, which connects to part of what I found so delightful and interesting about Risa, which is she does a lot of remote mentoring on Twitter around point of care ultrasound. And that's where I've really been following her and learning about mentoring from her example there. Uh, Risa is also an emergency physician at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Importantly to me, she's one of the founders of Time's Up, which is an organization that supports uh, gender equity and inclusion within healthcare. And most recently, she started um, amplifying her own and other people's voices in really interesting ways in her podcast, Visible Voices. So. Adara and Risa, welcome. So glad to have you both. Thank you for having us. Really appreciate this invitation and the opportunity to conversation. So um, Adara and Risa, I um, have read quite a bit in the mentoring literature. Um, there's sponsorship, there's directorship, there's mentoring. And when your article came out in HBR, it had sort of the impact on me and sort of cutting through all the noise and helping me really think about how do I organize myself with respect to connecting with my mentees? How do I organize myself with respect to connecting with my mentors? And I just, uh, I found it kind of defibrillated me in a way and, and sort of got me organized in a way to think about this that I hadn't before. Uh, then I was able, to stumble upon your article in the European Journal of Emergency Medicine, which talks about essentially sort of remote mentoring via Twitter. And I thought that was another really interesting angle on something that all of us do, but may not have conceptualized. So I feel that both these articles in a way do what Ron Heifetz calls adaptive leadership, which is naming and labeling things in a way that help others of us wrap our minds around it. So with that in mind, let's just start with why do you all mentor in the first place? It takes a lot of time. What's up with that? Thank you again, Jenny, for having us. Um, we're really excited to talk about this topic. It's something we're very passionate about. From a personal perspective, I, I, I mentor because of my own journey and what happened to me starting back in actually medical school. Um, I went to medical school in Southern California, um, a very diverse population. We actually had a pretty diverse student body. But what I found in the classroom seats, I didn't really see at the front of the classroom and, and as far as lectures or at the bedside as far as physicians. So there's a huge gap as far as what what I represented, who I was, and what was being offered to me as far as leadership. And so I found myself really pausing and, and feeling isolated and unsupported. Um, and I think a lot of it was because I was looking for a mentor who had a similar background and a similar perspective and life journey as I did. So I really went through most of medical school um, feeling unsupported without mentorship. And it really wasn't until I went to residency where I met um, another faculty member who reached out to me and really um, saw a part of herself, I believe in me, 
Um, she was also another woman, another woman of color, and she practiced in the department I was rotating in. And she really took me upon or underneath her, her wing. And, and that was something that she did on her own. She really initiated that. And it was the first time that I felt like someone had reached out to me and said, I know that you need support. I know there's a gap as far as where you are and where you wanna go. And I'm here to help fill that. And when I ended up matching at NYU for residency, she stayed on, this is Dr. Uche Blackstock. She stayed on as my mentor for the full four years and even continues to give me mentorship now. And I think the most appealing thing about this whole process was when I was an intern in so my first year in training, um, I, I was just planning on going to work and going home. And that was sort of the lifestyle I was propagating for myself. And she took me out to a diner. And I remember this day so vividly, you know, I remember eating, we were, she was sitting right across from me and she just sort of said, what are you like, what are your ambitions? And I hadn't thought about it beyond just like clinical practice. I thought that I was just going to be at the bedside. And she said, no, there's so much more that you can do with your MD. And she even said this, I just remember explicitly her saying, I really believe that you are gonna be our chief resident. And never before, never had someone who I aspired to be like, look down at me and said something as far as you can do what I have accomplished as well. And it was just so moving to me because I had never had that feeling. And so that really was what, was what, what inspired me to want to be a better person for myself so that I can sort of create this path for others to follow. Um, based off of that initial conversation. And of course, since then I picked up a wonderful array of mentors and advisors and sponsors, all different types of people have sort of supported me in different ways, but it really was that initial spark to that feeling of, oh my God, someone believes in me. Oh. That really drove me. And, and because of it, you know, I feel very, very, very happy when I'm mentoring someone. But at the same time, I also feel very sad knowing that I'm not gonna be able to reach everyone. It's almost like for every one person I'm talking to, I'm communicating with, I know that there's a huge group of people I'm missing out on because there's only so much that I can do. And I think that's really why um, Risa and I love to write is because it's a nice way of reaching that, that group that we wouldn't otherwise be able to contact. Um, Adara Landry, there's one piece of what you said, the many wonderful things that I'd just like to highlight, which is I do think there's something so powerful about being seen in a way that you might not have seen yourself. Somebody framing who you are and what your trajectory is in a way that opens up new horizons for you. And so that very personal quality of attention, I think is uh, something that I think many of us underestimate in the mentoring journey. So I just wanted to thank you for highlighting that. Exactly Lisa right. Lewis, I would love to hear from you. What why do you mentor? What got you into this? What's what 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 moves you about this? First, I'd like to say, Adara, you just gave me the chills. Thank you for sharing that story regarding Uche. Uh, I was asked this recently. So, as Adara and I have been working together and publishing on mentoring, I, I was asked a similar question, like, "Why do you do this?" or "Why do you think you got into it?" and I gave a little bit of a sports reference and I, I say it a bit tongue in cheek about the sports references because that's actually sometimes one of the challenges and problems we have in healthcare in terms of a, a safe, equitable and dignified environment is the sports references. That being said, I realized as I moved from college to medical school to residency training that I was not given the playbook. I was not given the rule book and I, would look around and my male colleagues somehow knew how to accomplish things, knew how to navigate the academic medical world, knew how to get things published, knew how to sit on committees, knew how to get invitations to conferences, all of these things that now I know how to do it, <laughs> but I didn't know. I wasn't given the rule book and the playbook. And it was uh, a combination of really generous people that saw me or, or, uh, uh, saw something in me, wanted me to be something, maybe, I don't know who would either pull me aside or, you know, I started having trusted friends, trusted coaches that I would ask, how do you do this? How do you do that? And so, you know, you get this summary of, of, of the rules and I started sharing that. And I, I would love to make people's paths easier. I would love to make all trainees coming through this system easier. Uh, it does not have to be opaque. Um, it should be open, transparent, communicative to everybody. And um, I do think it, those avenues have been open to some people, but not to everybody. I think this idea of the playbook or how do you get things done is so crucial. And 
the research on mentoring um, has burgeoned over the last 30 years, including sort of um, differentiating between mentorship and sponsorship. And some of what you're talking about there, Risa, is kind of almost in the middle ground where sponsorship is me making sure that you do get on committees or me making sure that you do get uh, your publication uh, submitted or me co doing things with you such that I literally boost you up to get there. You're talking about something in between, which I think is incredibly important. And I'm so happy to hear about that motivation because I think anything that remains sort of occult and hidden about how we advance makes it more difficult for us all to advance. So I just um, wanna underscore the value, I think about of what you're talking about there. Thank you. So I wanna shift gears now and talk a bit about writing for Harvard Business Review with you. Um, many of us uh, have learned how to write for um, health professions journals of different sorts, whether they're our disciplinary journal or whether they're uh, um, education journal or quality and safety journal. But writing for a more general managerial audience, I could imagine is quite different. And um, my experience uh, every time I'm in contact with Harvard Business School in different ways is they have a way of doing it. So I'm wondering if you could share with us a little bit about what did you learn about writing for HBR and how to do it for those of us who might wanna try. Risa, I'm gonna to toss the ball to you first to start us off. I'll start by saying that, you know, I was speaking of this playbook, this rule book. And I think in terms of publishing, what we're taught is how to publish in academic medical journal journals, academic healthcare journals. And you're spot on when you're writing for a non-medical arena, a non-medical piece, whether that is an op-ed piece in a newspaper, whether that's HBR, whether that's fill in the blank, it is different. Um, so as most people would guess, you have to think about your audience and you have to look at um, what gets published. And this is why reading helps writing, writing helps reading, reviewing helps reading, reviewing helps writing, everything feeds into getting better. I started being becoming a fan of, of reading HBR and articles from HBR as I wanted to develop my skills professionally as a leader, as a communicator. And uh, what I found was many, many, many of those articles, many are relevant to me. Many are relevant to healthcare, uh, but obviously they're not just written for doctors or written for medical people. So I think number one, it was adopting um, a format, adopting a style, um, of speaking um, to um, speak to a broader audience. And I would say also one of the things that's remarkable when you read an HBR piece is the clarity of language, the specificity of language and the concrete examples provided. So I'm gonna toss uh, to my, my, my writing partner, Adair, to sort of add her thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that was new to us um, was that we could actually strip down what we were doing within medicine and really expand it to a general audience. And so, like Reese and I were saying, we do a ton of mentorship in medicine that's very specific to medicine, right? Studying for boards, getting through rotations, um, going up for promotion as a, as a particular pathway. But you can take these skills that we you know, teach others and work with for others and really apply them to a broad audience. And I think, you know, I think the audience here is probably more, you know, simulation focused, but just thinking about some of the academic papers you've written on team training and debriefing and communicating through crisis, like that could be stripped down into a, a topic that would be applicable to the greater workforce. And so for us, we were thinking mentorship is something that we do regularly. We were writing during a pandemic, by the way, at the, almost at the peak of the pandemic, we were thinking about how everyone is busy and how can we really try to cater everyone's needs. So those of us who are really, really tight on time, but then also those students, those residents, those trainees, those junior faculty members who really feel unsupported right now. How can we sort of blend those forces? And we knew that it wasn't just in medicine. So we just started thinking about specific things that we were doing that we could do that we could recommend that would be applicable to everyone. I agree with Risa, the language is very different than what we're used to. And even 
when it comes to creating a sentence and supporting the sentence, they didn't really want, they didn't want to randomize controls trial or, or medical journals to support our sentences. It was other lay press and blog posts, something that we're very um, unused to doing as far as our writing style. So it was a really unique experience, but I think the most um, notable thing was really understanding that what we are doing in medicine, how we work in medicine, if you think about the skill set, it can be widely applied to else to other fields. I'd like to talk a little bit about um, what you said, Risa, about kind of stripping things down and uh, clarifying and crystallizing the message. Um, and I'm going to get into this with a little bit of a, a, a story, which is when I was a doctoral student in organizational behavior, I started, I had to read 25 papers a week and they were truly horrible to read. No offense to my uh, field of origin. And I thought I never ever wanna write like most of these people. And so I signed myself up for a creative writing program that I did for two semesters. And I certainly can improve my writing, we all can, but I think this idea of thinking of writing as a craft and a communication bridge is something that many academics don't do. Uh, they, we think of ourselves as having to just report on the research. And I noticed that both of you, um, not only in your HBR article, but in your uh, journal of Europe, uh, uh, European Journal of Emergency Medicine article and your tweets, you know, you try to be pretty crisp. You try to be pretty clear. Um, so could you give us an example of something that you had to kind of workshop or crispify or clarify as you were working on your HBR article? Something you might've said one way and then you gradually came to say another way? I'll, I'll start and then and then Adara will compliment. I just wanna say that Jenny, maybe a little bit of what you know of us and have seen on Twitter is because we're emergency physicians. <laughs> there is this directness and decisiveness to, you know, sick, not sick. Let's get this done. Are we moving admitted or discharged? You know, there is, so there's, that carries over the personality and, and the, the culture of emergency medicine perhaps um, is reflected in the writing. Um, whenever one is writing an article, whether you're writing it alone or with someone or with a larger group, you know, you develop your, your pace and your cadence. And Adair and I have gotten to know each other and writing with each other that we have a way of doing things that works. So, um, you know, it's not necessarily worth getting into that process, but what I will say is that, you know, when you work with someone, when you write with someone, um, you, if we keep this tennis, you know, you know, you do your part, you, you toss it to the other person back and forth, back and forth. And so it, it over time actually gets crisper and matures uh, in ways that um, sort of becomes very natural. And um, sometimes it's the tincture of time, plus, you know, the, the right rewrite, right rewrite and patience with that process. Adara. Yeah, I think the, the process is key. We write in a live document, so on Google Docs, so that we're able to communicate in real time. And I think that makes it easier than someone taking a, <clears throat> a document, sending it to me, I write it, and then I send it back to them. I think that's a little bit more of a, of a static picture. And so I think actually having it in a live document that we can comment on very quickly and, and respond to and, and, and um, resolve issues, I think helps with the process. If you're looking for a specific thing that we were, um, sort of struggling with that we had to really clarify and crystallize, it was the time piece, I believe, when, when it came to the time commitment and the HBR piece, as far as how much time we needed to ask or suggest for people to put aside for mentoring per mentee. Um, I remember the editor really wanted us to, to commit to a time frame instead of just saying, um, you know, think about how much time you want to commit to a student and, and discuss with them. They, I, the editor, I remember specifically saying, like, we have to pick an, a number of hours. And so that part we remember discussing, like, well, how often do you think people are going to meet? And, you know, for some students, it's going to be maybe twice a year. For some, it's going to be every other month. Some are going to require longer meetings. So I, that, like, back and forth, we really had to commit to. And a lot of why we wanted to write this was because of, as you mentioned, Jenny, a lot of literature on um, mentorship is, is quite vague, actually, as far as the, the strategy. And most of it is on the theory um, and, and the need, but not necessarily on the actual steps to take. And so we really wanted to do this in HBR, which is a very strategy-based um, resource, because we wanted to give finite guidance. So it was almost like a rule book, but you know, people can adapt it to their own needs and behaviors, but it was very, very, very pointed and directed. 
Yeah. Well, it's so funny that you mentioned that time-based uh, uh, goal or that uh, drive that the editor gave you, because I remember reading in the article, hmm, interesting, two to six hours. That's actually really interesting. If I talk to a mentee about that, I think that has a lot of benefits. Would you discuss whether, whatever time you do come up with? And, and I know you'll, we'll get to this in a moment, but I think it's a valuable thing to think about time as currency uh, in mentoring. So I just wanted to thank everybody who's on the uh, webinar with us now and invite you and remind you to please uh, uh, send us some questions in the Q&A. Uh, my colleague Ann Mullen will be monitoring those and shooting those to Risa, uh, Lewis, Adara Landry and me. And we'll either deal with them in the flow or we'll get to them at the end, but we're very excited to be in dialogue with you. So Risa Lewis and Adara Landry, your exciting and interesting articles on fuel efficient mentoring and on can we have good mentoring on Twitter, I think raise some really interesting, important um, questions for us on sort of the boundaries of um, mentoring. You know, one is about how do we manage the boundaries of time? How do we manage the commitments we make to each other as mentor and mentee. In the field of organizational behavior, we have a very powerful construct called the psychological contract, which is usually a tacit unspoken contract. And you only know it exists till um, when it gets violated. Hmm. And one of the things I loved about your article is that in a way it creates a specific mentoring contract. You don't use that language, but I think some agreements are really helpful in clarifying goals and so on. So I thought that was very powerful. And then the other area that I think uh, you're making a really interesting contribution in that I'd like to hear from you on is this idea of mentoring on Twitter. And um, what I thought was fascinating is it builds on the idea of Lave and Wenger's legitimate peripheral participation, which is far from a catchy phrase. But what Lave and Wenger studied was how do people learn in apprenticeship? And they had this idea that kind of by hanging around on the edges, there's important stuff to be learned. And I think that's part of what you're talking about as we talk about uh, mentoring on Twitter. So I'd love to hear from you, Risa or Adara. I know you had some thoughts on this. So I'm gonna let you decide who's going first, but love to hear about those articles help us understand the arguments. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to start with um, sort of summarizing the concept and, and the purpose of the, of the Harvard Business Review article, what efficient mentorship looks like. Um, just as I said earlier, this was really born out of um, what was going on during COVID and really trying to um, generalize it to the, the audience. And um, we really wanted to make sure that people knew that there's really a way to be an efficient mentor to connect with other people, but while also conserving your energy. Many of us were being stretched at the time and still even now today with responsibilities at home, with increased clinical care or academic duties. And so the idea of taking on something that has traditionally been unrecognized and potentially uncompensated, such as mentorship, though it's very valuable, that is a reality, might have lowered people's um, um, commitment to it. And so we wanted to make sure that that wasn't something that could have been really swept through the side to the side for the entire year as we go through this pandemic. So that was really the, the impetus behind this um, um, article. And as you mentioned earlier, it really does start off with an upfront conversation. And I have found that many, you know, many of the relationships that um, that I've been in that didn't really flourish, it was because I think there were a lot of unmet expectations and the communication style and, and what they were able to provide and what I needed. It really wasn't clarified in the beginning. And so all of that initial interest, I think it just sort of fades, fades out, not because of any one person's fault, it just the dynamic hasn't been clarified yet. So I really think a great place to start is really by establishing expectations. And, and, and what we discuss in our article is very similar to how Risa and I practice, which is who's responsible for a lot of the logistics and the operational work. And, and, and that's something that's probably an uncomfortable conversation to have until you start doing it more and more. 
So for instance, for you know, a student, for instance, who I might be mentoring, they know up front that the expectation is if they want to reach out to me to schedule a meeting, I'm expecting them to set up the time, to set up the, in this case, a Zoom invite with a link, calendar invite, all of those sorts of things I want them to do. And it's just another thing as far as a skill set for them to be learning as far as responsibility and organization and accountability, I think it's great for them to have all of that on their plate. This allows the mentor to focus on the broader things, such as if the student sends the agenda ahead of time, now I can think about what is it that I'm going to say, how am I going to support them, and you're doing less of the operational logistical stuff. So I, I really think um, teaching them that ownership of driving the relationship is great. Now, of course, there are some exceptions where I try to help out, but I think in general, I, I, I put it on my mentee, but it wouldn't be fair to do that, as you mentioned earlier with this unwritten psychological contract. It wouldn't be fair to expect them to do that unless I told them, because many people just don't know the lay of the land. They don't know that that's something that they should be doing. So really starting off with that conversation is important. We talked very briefly about time. Time is a very valuable currency for all of us, especially as we mature through our field, we start to have other relationships and other commitments. We start to see time as a, a huge asset. So up front, I start to talk to, um, to my residents or my medical students about what type of time commitment I have. And you know, um, sometimes people will ask for an hour of my time. And I am happy to do that if there's a need. But many times, a lot of the questions they have can be, answered via email or via other avenues. So I really want to make sure that before I commit to a certain time frame, I, I'm, I'm understanding what it is that they need. And, um, you know, I, and I realize that some students might need more time than others. And so you have to sort of be flexible. In this article, we recommend two to six hours for the average person, depending on their needs, right? If you're working on a research project, you might be meeting with them a lot more often than if it's just let me make sure you get through your first year of your graduate school studies. Okay, maybe we just need to meet three times or four times a year. It just depends on their needs. But just understanding and letting them know that up front, like this is how much I expect to commit to you, is great because then they can start to um, budget their time in a wise way and not just sort of spend it too quickly. And they'll be a little bit more careful about reflecting and thinking about their own questions and potential answers even before they meet with you because they know, oh, I only have, let's say, a 20 minute window versus what I thought could have been 60 minutes. Let me make sure that I'm really like streamlined. And I use this in my own practice as well. When I meet with senior folks, I don't really request a long time uh, from their calendar. I request a very targeted um, period of, of, of time and I have a very targeted question for them as well that I've already thought about in much detail. Adira, One of the just I if I Dara, could yeah. I just jump in here for a second because you've said so many valuable things and I wanna just recap and comment on a couple of them. So I think one of the powerful implicit things that uh, your article in Harvard Business Review highlights is this idea of helping mentees learn a standard or learn a set of criteria about how are we gonna interact. And I think what's really important about that beyond the logistics of the meetings and the conservation of time is essentially you're supporting them in doing self-regulated learning. In self-regulated mentoring, for example, which is what I think you're supporting them to do to some degree, the standard of how are we going to work together becomes explicit to them and that way they can compare, like, here's the standard I'm expecting an agenda, I'm expecting you to set the uh, appointment, et cetera. And then they can notice, uh, actually, I'm, I'm here, I really need to still work to close that gap. And so much of what we do in apprenticeship and mentoring remains implicit. And so I want to celebrate the idea that not only are you helping people with the content, the playbook, whatever's happening in those conversations, but you're establishing norms for a playbook that will make them more successful in all their interactions, um, as you noted there at the end, Adara. So thank you for those ideas. Uh, back to you. Yes, um, and one of the things is, you know, a lot of people feel this way. 
And a lot of these experiences of not really understanding the playbook, it's shared. And so one of the things that we did um, throughout this year is, uh, or that, um, that, that I did was a lot of group mentoring. And so I did this in, in a way to help both parties. It helps myself, right? Because I had three students, I remember at one time messaging me to meet on the same topic, which was how do I prepare my CV? And they all had the same thing that they wanted to discuss. I thought, well, wouldn't it be great to just combine them all into one meeting? It's efficient. And then they can also bounce each other's questions off of one another. And so um, the idea of consolidating people with shared experiences who, who can you know, validate each other, who can teach each other and develop this sort of peer-to-peer or near-peer mentorship um, relationship b- between each other was also an asset. And so thinking and getting creative with how you can combine your mentors, your mentees, excuse me, so that they can really grow from each other was a new concept for us. Um, to do within medicine. It's not necessarily a new concept within the field of mentorship, but I hadn't really done that before. And so I wanted to write about that. Um, Obviously we were sort of forced to go virtual. And so I think the idea of um, really trying to use the Zoom platform in a way that made people feel engaged. So I actually do ask anyone who joins my group, my group mentoring to turn their camera on. I say it at the beginning, when people join late, I say it again, it's just a requirement. because I really want people to feel engaged. I'm fully committed. They need to be fully committed as well. So I make that an expectation. I let them know ahead of time that I do expect cameras to be on and audio to be unmuted just so that they, they I see that commitment and I see that they're really dedicating themselves to the conversation. There's other avenues that I have used. I've used group messaging through ta- through text messaging, all sorts of ways to just consolidate people and let them connect with each other exist. And so that was really one strategy that we, we tried to explore. And the last thing, this is my secret sauce that I started doing before COVID, which was I would double down on opportunities. So if I were going to, let's say a women's event, right? I know I'm going, I'm going anyway, it's on my schedule, but I knew I had a a, a mentee who was a student or a resident who also would benefit from that experience. I invited them and, and, and I bring them along. They can get to know the group of people who I'm, I'm connecting with. If they have colleagues there, then I can get to know their colleagues. It's a mutually beneficial experience and that they weren't otherwise going to be able to go. And now they get this opportunity. And I also get to consolidate two, um, two opportunities. And they love it. I mean, I, I have, I've gotten very positive feedback from doing this. You can even do this in the virtual world. I've invited some people to certain meetings or seminars or webinars virtually as well, just so that they can sort of see my reach, see my influence, see what I'm working on. It gives them a lot of that exposure to the playbook and how, how I converse with my colleagues. A lot of it is just that exposure, which I think is really helpful for people. So all of these strategies that we discussed in this article are meant to help both parties. It's, help, it's meant to help the, the mentor shape their calendar in a way that is sustainable. It's meant to help the the mentee really understand strategy when it comes to developing their career. So it was meant from from both angles to be supportive of both parties. So I love those uh, multiple themes and the idea of making things count twice, uh, which George Bordage has written about so beautifully in when we do educational activities, we could research them also. I think you're extending that principle to mentoring, which is a lovely idea. And something that occurred to me, Adara, which we're doing right now, is we're having a conversation. Uh, It's public. So there's some legitimate peripheral participation, but we're also recording it. Um, So I'm just thinking, you know, with those 50 medical students you have, you know, with their permission, you could have watch this mentee conversation on X, watch this mentee conversation on Z. Um, so there's many possibilities, and I, I would not have thought of them without your sort of opening up that pathway in the article. Uh, Risa, I'm thinking we might shift over to talking about can good mentoring be found on Twitter? And um, I know I have many colleagues who take quite a dim view of all social media. Um, and um, yet, I think more and more of us are finding dialogue and learning online while also sustaining some healthy skepticism, uh, which I think is captured in the title of your article, um, Can It Be Done? So talk to us about that. Sure. So, you know, truth be told, I am one of those social media skeptics and social media 
um, uh, risk, not risk aversive, but risk careful, I will say. Uh, my first opening into Twitter was I was at a college alumni event and a young alum was talking about the benefits and the positives of social media, specifically Twitter. And this is around the time that I started seeing uh, people in the emergency medicine and specifically medical educators uh, on Twitter, putting out content, highlighting articles, talking about conferences. And uh, Adair and I started appreciating the same thing and started looking at the literature on Twitter. There's not a lot written. What is written is about the benefits of um, Twitter for medical education. We had not seen a lot about the benefits for professional development. And you tapped on this a bit, Jenny. Um, I have learned with ultrasound that if we're doing something in our shop um, and we think it's interesting or we think it's uh, effective, we haven't seen anything written about it, write about it. So we employed the same concept with this Twitter and mentoring. You know, Dara and I were doing this. She was running these group mentoring sessions weekly, pictures on Twitter. And I'm like, let's write about it. I've never seen anybody write about mentoring via Twitter. And she and I both have these experiences, both have these stories of making a friend on Twitter. Um, the term is fritter, making a fritter and okay. or sort of uh, passively following someone. I, I really like what you described, the theory of the peripheral learning and just watching someone who's an influencer, someone who maybe has that check, that blue check that Twitter uh, seems to bestow upon some people. Uh, you know, their algorithm for who gets it is still unclear and kind of controversial. But the bottom line is there are people that have their check. So you start following people in your community, in your subject matter expertise area. And then what do you do? You reach out to them. You know, you send a DM, a direct message, if they have an open DM. If not, you somehow connect with them, uh, tweet back, retweet, like. There's many ways to engage. And it's pretty uh, low risk and very easy. Uh, in the article, we talk about if you have Wi-Fi uh, connectivity, then you essentially can set up an account and get on Twitter. And even within my ultrasound division, you know, not everybody's really on board and wants to be on. I, I ask them to consider starting an account. Don't even tweet, don't put any content, but it's a great way to keep up on the learning. Now to actually take it to the next level of mentorship, uh, we talk about in the article uh, why that is, how easy it is, how low risk it is, and also how to handle it when it doesn't go well. Like what happens if you tweet to someone, connect with someone, and you hear nothing? Um, it was Adara that really pointed out, you know, most people are extremely complimented when you reach out and uh, you'd like to establish a mentoring relationship with them. Sometimes they're just too busy. They have a lot on their plate, no bandwidth. Um, sometimes they, you know, it's just not the right time. Or, um, and this is just a general principle of mentoring, say someone approaches you about a topic that you just don't think is your, your strong suit. So you can then... Um, hand it to someone or introduce that mentee to someone who can potentially be better suited to answer their questions. Um, I think we wrote the piece, uh, number one, because we believe in it. Number two, because we hadn't seen anything written about it. And you were the one that highlighted that sometimes like people just need to see the codification of it. And they're like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. And you know, we don't have delusions of grandeur. Like we know people have been doing this, but we hadn't seen it written. Uh, and that goes back to actually learning that, that, that rule book, that playbook of, you know, write, getting something in writing and it, the power of the currency of writing. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the process of mentoring and learning on Twitter, uh, both helping people develop their either knowledge, their knowledge of the field, uh, goals and or um, being a learner, as it were, via Twitter. Um, that book by um, Laven Wenger uh, described apprenticeship in this very kind of hands-on way where they literally looked at things like wood shops and uh, there's a later article uh, coming beyond their work on, on making musical instruments. And they talk about how the apprentices in this craft world, you know, literally are standing at the journeyman or journeywoman or master's side, seeing how they move, seeing how they handle the lathe, seeing how they craft the instrument. And I think on Twitter, um, we are also observing how do people phrase things? Where do people point? 
how do they engage others and ask questions? And um, Risa, you mentioned yourself as being sort of risk cautious, which suggests to me that as an apprentice uh, at, at the time, or even now, as you're learning to use your voice on Twitter, as I still feel like I'm using, learning to use my voice on Twitter, could you walk us through the kinds of things that you watch for to learn how other people are doing things such that we all could benefit from that? Absolutely. And thank you for that question. So uh, I think part of it is to know uh, you came up with this, like, what's the frame? You know, what is my frame? And when I'm on Twitter, uh, what hat am I wearing? You know, if I'm wearing the hat of professional emergency physician, point of care ultrasound, subject matter expert, uh, leader, um, you know, purveyor of, of equity, you know, um, I have an awareness of what I put out and sort of how things can be read, how they can be interpreted. You know, um, we hear about bullying, we hear about retaliation. Like, I think there, there is um, a responsibility to putting, putting things out on Twitter and, and putting messaging out responsibly. So that's, you know, one of, that's what I, I'm talking about with the risk, because uh, we have seen people that put things out, you know, um, a sort of, you know, just side comments, side joke, side remark that then blows up and actually is quite destructive, either personally or professionally to people. So I do think like, we all should be thinking about what we're putting out on Twitter. Can I just pause you for one second, Risa? Sure. You said something else that I think is really important, though, which is you're almost sort of bystanding your identity. I'm a point of care ultrasound expert. I'm an emergency physician. I care about equity in healthcare, And I'm thinking about how I'm presenting these ideas and how they may be consumed. And I do think that that is part of the mentoring playbook Absolutely. that we're all working on, whether we're writing academically, whether we're presenting academically, this very webinar that we're doing, I'm thinking about how am I pulling these ideas together as an organizational behavior person and as a simulation person. And there's this responsibility, I think, for thinking about how we're bridging to other people's thought worlds. Um, do you want to say a little bit about that? Or, or? Absolutely. So to that end, in the paper, we talk about if you're going to be engaging on Twitter, you should put up a professional picture. You should consider your Twitter handle and know, you know, there's all different ways to do Twitter handle, but maybe rather than say, saying something that's sort of uh, witty, that maybe you want to put your name so you're identifiable and, you know, people sort of seeing this, that you're engaging in Twitter from a professional perspective. Um, so this is like, we're talking about modeling. We're talking about how as a mentor, you are teaching your mentee. So part of it is how you set up your own profile, you know, how you describe uh, yourself in your profile. Uh, another aspect is when you're just getting familiar with Twitter and trying to figure out who to follow, what to follow is find a friend, find an influencer, find someone you respect and see who they follow. And that gives you ideas uh, for how to start growing your network in that way. Um, I do think that uh, we have a responsibility for being professional and demonstrating sort of um, professional communications, professional relationships. Not everybody plays Twitter and plays social media this way. This is just a way that I've certainly chosen to use it and take it because my entry was professionally and uh, I do believe in it as an educator. Thank you for that. So thinking um, as we mentor in private, as we mentor in groups, as we mentor online, um, thinking about how we're connecting with others and that how we present ourselves is part of, of the picture. Uh, so Adara and Risa, um, I'd like to take about two minutes and just ask you to share with us your thoughts about next steps, um, either around your writing, how you wanna use your lens as MDs, sharing with a broader audience. We may or may not be able to get to everything, but whatever catches your fancy that we could do maybe in a minute from each of you before we turn to our uh, questions and answer dialogue with our participants. Adara? Yes, I'm happy to start. You know, um, before I think before I wrote this piece, I never really thought about um, the progression of what happens um, to the dialogue that is generated after the piece is published. I, I think I've 
have generally in the past published something, forgot about it, moved on to the next. And I, this is the first time where Risa and I really try to keep the conversation going, at least from my personal perspective. And so one of the things that we've done is we've done a few podcasts, I think three podcasts, this webinar, we've even had a spinoff paper um, that we published to um, mentorloop.com on a similar topic. And so keeping the ball rolling was a very new strategy for me as far as really developing that brand that Risa was mentioning on like Twitter. You can sort of develop that brand on Twitter. You can develop it in your, your portfolio, on your CV, as far as all the engagements that you have. It's all surrounded the same topic of mentorship. So I think next steps for me would be to keep thinking about how can I continue the conversation and keep um, um, spreading that word, going back to what I mentioned in the beginning, which is that I feel really happy for the folks I'm able to reach. And I have a lot of sadness for those who I can't. So the more I can um, um, connect with and, and engage with, I think is gonna, you know, I think help share this message and, and, and help hopefully develop other people's careers, which is our ultimate, our ultimate goal. Risa Lewis. So I agree that sort of the more you write and the more you talk about and dialogue on this, the more ideas come to mind. And uh, I will often, when working on one of the pieces we're working on, you know, put some more ideas for next papers. And so I would like to um, think critically, conceptually, and write about some aspects of mentorship that are perhaps not talked about. So the mentor relationships gone bad or um, sort of one of the things I say is it's okay. Like if, if a mentorship relationship doesn't work out, like sometimes it, you need to break up. Um, the other thing is, you know, I think that there's sometimes not beautiful sides of mentorship. It's not always positive. And I personally have experienced certain situations where someone posed as mentor, but actually had alternative, pretty selfish motives. So uh, I think um, sort of the authenticity uh, of uh, the true full rounded uh, experience, because I think, you know, it's easy to talk about everything going well, it's easy to talk about the positive, but we know, you know, in the audience, not everybody has had positive uh, experiences. So I think the more we talk about those stories, um, the even more effective people can be in their professional lives. Mm. So that's a wonderful strategic uh, move in my view. There's an author uh, in my field named Diane Vaughn who has written several really interesting articles on quote unquote, the dark side of organizations, mm. which is when hiring goes poorly, when firing goes poorly, when things go unexpectedly uh, badly. And I think that's how we manage the boundaries of things I think is in a way a wonderful contribution that you both are already making with this time management boundaries and then with this social media sort of extending the boundaries of, of mentoring. So that's really exciting. Anne Mullen, I'd like to move to our questions and answers, which I have scanned through a bit, but I welcome you to direct us if you wish. Great. I was thinking that two of the questions are sort of tips about how to initiate a mentorship uh, relationship if you're the first person to reach out and ask to be mentored are there any tips on how to do that and then the second related question is any tips on what to do if things are not going well as you were just discussing how do you sort of manage that when you know things aren't going well the, the other question is more of a big thinking question about the balance between sort of this efficient mesh mentorship and deep mentorship. So the balance between trying to have a lot of volume and a lot of depth. And I'm wondering, you know, if you'd like to respond to those questions. Why don't we start Adara and Lisa, uh, Risa with the, um, how to reach out as a mentee and then what to do potentially if a mentee doesn't really follow up in the way that you want. Um, Adara, can we start with you and then yeah, I'll start from a personal place. I mean, I, I went to my chair about six months ago and I asked for more mentorship from senior women in, in medicine, and um, which is a big ask um, um, for him to sort of hook me up with someone who's connected in that way. And so he gave me a name and an email address. I reached out to that person. Um, but before I did that, I wanted to make sure that this person actually satisfies what my needs were. And so I thought about, well, what is it that I'm looking for? Why do I need this mentorship um, relationship to begin with? So I really started by understanding my needs. And then, I, and then I understood what they had to offer. 
And then I reached out and sort of explained those things in an email very quickly, like in a paragraph or so. And I asked for a finite period of time from them. And I actually strategically, for people who are very busy, I try to have morning meetings instead of midday where they might get bumped. So I asked for a morning time, like 8 a.m. Um, so the earliest you're able to meet, I'll, I will work around that. And I, I just asked for a very short period of time just to get to know each other and make sure that our energy matches. I think, you know, we talk about a lot of reasons why mentorship fails. You know, we could talk about um, their interest might match my interests, but their energy could be completely different. Our personalities could be completely different or our schedules can be completely malaligned. So there's all different reasons, but the first one I wanna make sure is that our energy is the same. Our personalities are compatible. So just a short meeting, just to get to know them, ask a few questions that are finite and straightforward. And then at the end of that meeting, you know, have a goal for the next meeting. So, oh, thank you so much for talking to me about this opportunity. I'm gonna go ahead and write this paper. Do you mind if, you know, once it gets published, I circle back with you, forward it and talk to you about that, that experience or something like that. Just sort of keeps that conversation going. So every time I end a conversation with someone, I have a reason, I have already planted the seed for why I will be circling back to them. And just so that they know that for sure, I'm going to come back to you. And I'm explicit about that. If they say no, if they, for, for whatever reason, cannot, as Risa mentioned, some people are just busy. That schedule that we mentioned earlier, that I mentioned just a second ago, it doesn't align. Or our interest doesn't align. So they might say no. And if that's the case, I say, that's totally fine. Is there someone else who you could recommend? One or two people. And then at that point, you can have another point of contact. So just kind of keep that snowballing. The main thing is you don't really want the conversations to close, except in potentially those bad, uh, those bad you know, outlier cases. But the vast majority of things are very po positive and nourishing. So you want to keep that conversation going. Fantastic. Um, Risa, how about you pick up on um, the situation where potentially you've been working with a mentee, they haven't really followed up, um, they're not holding up their end of the bargain in your view, what's next? I've definitely been in situations where I seem to want the relationship more, more than the other person. And uh, sometimes, you know, when you, when you talk about this mentor-mentee relationship, you, it sounds like you could be talking about a personal relationship or a professional relationship, but some of the same rules apply. So I think if the, that energy feels unbalanced, I think you have to pause, think about it, and have as authentic and honest as a conversation as possible with the individual. And sometimes, you know, unfortunately, you, you don't get the no. Sometimes you don't hear the follow-up and you just get no response, which is a response in and of itself. Uh, I had a personal experience where I had attended um, a Harvard Macy program and I felt like I was completely among my people, a lot of medical educators, really inspiring. And there was a senior dean position um, woman and who I just was like, wow, like she somehow knew how to navigate this world. And I tried very, very, very hard to meet with her um, with the hope of establishing a mentor mentee relationship. And um, it just, you know, she was always too busy. And, and, and it, I finally got the message like Risa, she doesn't, she's, she's not interested in being your mentor. It was fine. I, I do wish that I had had a direct messaging of that as opposed to try, 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 try. So um, it's a little different than what you asked, but I, I think that whether you are, you are the mentor or the mentee, um, it is important to assess um, how uh, comfortable and how organic the, re the relationship is. Um, it doesn't mean that someone has to look like me, be like me, or have my personality. And in fact, quite often you learn the most from people that have very different perspectives, very different lived experiences than you in terms of your own growth. Um, I want to encourage everybody to not feel like it's a failure or a loss if a relationship does not work out. And in fact, by um, deciding that that is not one you're going to continue with, it kind of allows you to pick your head up, look around and see all of the helpers and all the potential mentors available to you. Mm. Ann Mullen, could you just reboot that second question, please? Sure. Um, thinking about when you're working with a mentor, you often develop this, the mentor-mentee relationship is often a very deep relationship where you spend a lot of time getting to know the person and even you know, calming them down when they're under pressure. Um, and how do you balance that depth of experience with the 
efficient mentoring process. So is there a deep mentoring uh, versus efficient mentoring that you could maybe- And, and speaking about? of the uh, dilemma between deep and efficient, Adara and Risa, we have about a minute to talk about this. So Adara? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, I think those times of needs, those time of crisis, I, I, I definitely think that you need to deep, dive deep into the conversation and really understand what's going on with your mentee. And so from a mentor perspective, I definitely have had residents or students or, or even um, other junior faculty member who've gone through personal crisis, um, you know, loss of, of a loved one or something like that. And at that point, I'm not really trying to be as efficient as I am trying to be supportive. And so I still think about my time budget at, at, at any given point, and, and I have to make sure that I maintain my own personal wellness, and my own personal sanity and my schedule, but I might in that short period of time consider um, uh, spending a little bit more of the time up front while they're in a greater need. In addition, if I feel like what they require, I do not have the capacity to provide, then I start recommending other folks that they can meet with as well. So I, I don't have just one mentor, I have the whole panel. And so if I know a student also has other people they can go to, I will, I will highly encourage that. And a lot of what I do as a mentor, I know I'm almost up with my one minute, but a lot of what I do as a mentor is I serve as a conduit. And so if someone is really needing a lot of deep support, a lot of um, um, encouragement from any area, right? From mental health, from study practices, from career development, I might refer to them to a service or some person who does that exclusively. And so my role will just be to check in that they're actually getting their needs met by these people. And I'm just a conduit. Fantastic. Risa Lewis, I'd like to give you the last word if you wish to have it. Um, you've thought a lot about mentoring, efficiency, spreading it out over the internet via Twitter. You do deep work, I'm sure, with your colleagues there at Thomas Jefferson University. How would you take us out on this subject? Thank you. I do think there are naysayers, people that don't believe in and think we're, we're going the wrong route by uh, making an argument for fuel efficiency and making an argument for virtual mentorship via social media. Um, I think if anything, these are not mutually exclusive. They are absolutely complementary, and people should consider them tools in their toolbox, depending on the situation, uh, both the, the mentor, him or herself, as well as the mentee, him or herself. And if one is not in the, you know, the non-binary as well, but what I'm saying is these are not exclusive. These are not, um, uh, sort of uh, unavailable to everybody. These are more opportunities of engaging and helping trainees. And so they should be thought of as not as threatening, but as very positive ways to move forward and help all of us navigate 2020 and moreover, all of us to navigate those coming after us. Thanks, Risa. So I'd really like to thank uh, Dr. Adara Landry and Dr. Risa Lewis for joining us to talk about mentoring uh, efficiently mentoring online and deepening the conversation about this in health professions education. Uh, if you want to stay in touch with Risa and be part of her, and you want to stay in touch with Adara and be part of her uh, online mentoring, their Twitter handles are here. I too try to curate various different things via at Get Curious Now, so please feel free to be in a mentoring dialogue with me there like to just tell you a little bit more about what we have coming up. I noticed a number of you asked about online health professions education, online health professions PhDs. Pictured here is uh, Janice Palaganis, uh, a nurse PhD who's leading the health professions uh, PhD program, uh, including a focus on simulation at the Massachusetts General Hospital Institute for Health Professions and collaborates and is a uh, member of the Center for Medical Simulation as well. So feel free to reach out to her. That's a really great way to go. Um, we are continuing this online community of practice and really trying to mentor each other in certain ways as peers, since we're using the language of mentoring today via these weekly webinars. Um, so please feel free to join us. I'm gonna just jump to uh, our next webinar and then come back to a couple other things on January 13th, when we'll be thinking about how do you get ready and stay ready as a perioperative team uh, with obstetrical emergencies, uh, presented by Rebecca Meinhart and Amelia Rudolph. 
And Rebecca's thought a lot about managing crises, connecting with each other in the perioperative environment. And Amelia Rudolph, who shares a last name with me because she's my sister, pioneered aerial dance. So she dances a lot on buildings and cliffs many thousands of feet up. And so she thinks a lot about how do you keep teams safe? Um, and so Rebecca and Amelia have put their heads together to think about how do you keep teams safe in COVID? How do you keep each other resilient over time? And so that should be really a lot of fun and very interesting. Other things that we do are we help you use something called the debriefing assessment for simulation and healthcare. It's a debriefing assessment tool, but we really use it to build peer communities of practice. So we can watch each other's debriefings, give each other good feedback, have good feedback conversations, do self-assessment. So we'll be having one of those in January. And I actually just looked at my calendar. I think I might be the one leading that. Please feel free to come to our advanced simulation instructor course in February. We've moved it online. And if you want to deepen your debriefing skills and your healthcare simulation design skills, join us. And our um, flagship healthcare simulation essentials course has uh, been reinvented over the last six months by my wonderful colleagues, such that we really focus on solving practical problems for our colleagues in hospitals, health systems, uh, medical schools and nursing schools uh, via the partnership pathway of using some design thinking to think about how we do simulation as well as um, continuing to help you with uh, debriefing skills. So Adara um, and uh, Risa, thanks so much for joining us. And for others of you on here, thank you so much for your questions and being part of this. Feel free to reach out to us at harvardmedsim.org. Mary Fay, Damian Shield pictured here can help you on your journey, whatever that might be. And I'm also happy to do so. So with that, everybody, thank you so much for being with us. Risa, goodbye, Adara, goodbye. And Mullen, thanks for the support. See you all next time, I hope.